Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow Pikers, and welcome to the Pikecast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co host. Hi, I'm Cassie. And Becca is somewhere in the ether today. And today we are digging into Christopher Pike's 1999 book, The Grave. And we're going to be discussing it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist. So consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. So let's welcome our guest piker this week, Jen Wexler, a writer and director whose directorial debut, The Ranger, premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival and was released on Shudder, which may be my favorite streaming service. Welcome to the podcast, Jen. Hey, thanks for having me. We're so happy you're here, and we're so happy you're here to talk about uh, The Grave, which is our latest Pike book of all of them. So, I mean, it may be one of the latest we ever do. 1999. You know, we've been we've been hanging out in 91 and 89, but 99, that's, that's pretty cool. So we have a few questions we like to ask all of our guests. How did you discover Christopher Pike? I think I discovered Christopher Pike in the Walden Books at mm-hmm. the mall. Mm-hmm. I remember hanging out there for hours at a time I don't know if it was quite hours but in my mind in my memory it was like staring at the different covers and reading the backs and I feel like you know the similar experience to the video store where you we used to all stare at the covers and look at the backs and kind of just imagine what the contents were uh yeah and I mean the covers were very I feel like I I kept a couple of them in the back of my mind for quite a long time. They're vivid. They're, they're memorable. And, uh, you know, this is later in the game with Pike now for the grave. And I'm not sure if it's still the same artist. In fact, it does not look like Brian Kotsky's artwork, but the early Pikes were so vivid with their, you know, candy coloring and, uh, lurid, (laughs) lurid covers. Yeah. The neons. Mm Mm-hmm. This one is Franco Acornero. I'm sorry, wow, Franco, okay. if I'm butchering your name, sir. <laughs> and, <laughs> sir, that's the, no, yes, yes, sir. And um, with the grave, this one, I actually like, I have a couple of books from childhood that are mm. still in my, uh, you know, now in my home office. And this one was just here. So when I started chatting with you guys about coming on, I was like, oh, well, here's this. This is supposed to be the one that I talk about because it's staring at me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that is how we chose our first few books, which ones Becca actually already had. So, yeah. So what is the thing that keeps Christopher Pike's books on your mind? Like the covers and just the ones that you've read, like what brings him back to your mind over and over again over the years? Yeah, I would say his writing is very cinematic and atmospheric. Mm-hmm. Um, so I haven't read that many. Like, they're, um, I was reading them probably when I was like 10 or 11 years old. And mm-hmm. at that time, I was also reading like R.L. Stein. And like, I remember reading the um, Sweet Valley High horror books. Wait, Sweet Valley High had a horror series? They were, they were horror books and they were like more adult than really? the regular Sweet Valley High. Yeah. I didn't so, know about those. I only wow. read the ra- the basic Sweet Valley ones. Oh, I'm yeah. missing out. Yeah. Just go back and check those out. I remember <laughs> one one of them of the Sweet Valley High, like, teen horror ones really sticks in my mind where the, the like, the cheerleader twin gets, like, kidnapped and tied up in a basement. And then there's, like, 
oh water gosh. filling the basement. And <laughs> that one wow. scene has like really stuck with me for some reason. But um, regarding Pike, I remember reading, actively reading Die Softly. Oh, yeah. And, which was like, actually, like, I was, you know, I was like looking it back up before coming on here <laughs> and like thinking like, wow, like, you know, the filming cheerleaders and stuff in the bathroom. Like yeah. at the time it didn't, it didn't feel as wrong and problematic to me. As yeah. <laughs> now I'm like, that was, was not cool. Like what was wrong with 10 year old Jen? That you... and, I mean, really it was what was wrong with all of us. Yeah. Is that we, the, the society was okay with that then. Yeah. That, yeah. Like, yeah. Cause I feel like it wasn't just, in that book, it was like all over. No, oh, Revenge of the Nerds. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's an iconic uh, comedy with which involves you know raping someone and filming them in in the changing room. Yeah, yeah, Not hilarious. Cool. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also, I remember the Midnight Club, which just like made me really sad. Yeah, yes. it's a it's a bummer of a book. That it is really a bad is. One. You know, it's funny because uh, I agree that Pike's books are some of the most cinematic uh, books I read all of my uh, childhood into adulthood. And it always shocked me that no one was adapting them. Yeah. Like I was obsessed with the idea. You, you know how um, Kevin Williamson, he gets this big hit and scream and then he goes back and adapts one of his childhood favorite books. I know what you did last summer. And yeah. so I was obsessed with getting a big hit movie written and then being able to go back and adapt Whisper of Death. Because <laughs> that was your whole that was, plan. That was my whole plan. <laughs> and, and you know, now that I'm finally actually making inroads into the industry, they're fucking making all these Christopher <laughs> Pike stuff. Right. And I don't get to do it. It's really, it's really just about me. I'm, you missed I'm your window. Grim. I, I missed think my window. I think you'll have the opportunity to live your dreams someday. Yeah. I believe oh. in this. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, because you. I mean, think about how many times things get remade. Like in ten <laughs> years, even if they make Whisper of Death right now, you can just make Whisper of Death again later well, on. But, yeah. but not if Mike Flanagan does it, because he's going to do it perfect. But I'm, yeah, I was going to say, like, if he, does, <laughs> I'll probably watch him be like, "Oh, this is so great! I love this." Because I'll fuck that guy. Cooper. He's just so good at what he does. <laughs> he's very good at everything. <laughs> Than he does. <laughs> well, why don't we move into Mag uh, Magic Fire, which is our section about the aesthetics of the book itself. Uh, Cassie, do you mind reading the back of the book this week? Yep. Well, nope. Nope, I don't mind. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The grave is not the end of the story. It begins with an innocent young man being led deep into the woods by a mysterious young lady. There, he is attacked by a cruel cult, stripped of his clothes, thrown naked into a coffin, and buried alive to the sound of strange chants. It continues with a pretty girl meeting a fascinating guy. A guy who is not like other guys, who hardly seems to blink or breathe, and who emits a cool presence even in the midday sun. <laughs> it ends in a nightmare, in a weird realm of existence where life and death mirror each other, where the grave no longer promises any escape from pleasure or pain. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> now... Was there ever any doubt, even reading the fucking back of the book, that the guy who dies in the first, the prelude, is the guy who she meets in the second part? Why am I always late to things that you pick up right away, Cooper? Really? Yeah, like, and I've read this before. I forgot. Even, even just reading that the back of the cover, like when I was building our Scholastic Book Club thing for this one, and I was having to condense that ridiculous description <laughs> into one paragraph, it's just like, well, I mean, it's obviously the same guy. <laughs> No, okay, I was like, that's I'm another married. cult member. He's creepy too. I, I don't I don't mean to make you feel bad that you didn't <laughs> recognize that. I'm sorry. I will say though, Ted and Oscar feel like very different characters. They do. And they don't tell you how much time has passed between the first part and the next part. So it could have been like Okay, years. that's it could have been like that's an hour. very true. Uh I I won't I won't lord my uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I just pick up on Pike's quirks. It's not that I know more. It's just that I understand what he's doing. <laughs> um, this cover is not good. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, 
you know, maybe I'm just spoiled by the brilliant Brian Kotsky artwork. And I don't like the knockoff Christopher Pike title font. I don't, I'm, I have problems. It reminds me more of like zombie, I think, than the book is actually yeah. going for. Well, and it I... appears to be her seeing herself as a demon. Yeah, or dead. Like, I yeah. I thought this was going to be a book about a doppelganger, like a dead doppelganger. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't. And also, there's like, <laughs> there's no graveyards in this book. No, there, no, there aren't. <laughs> <laughs> and the grave is actually one of the least important parts of the story. Well, so I think the grave is supposed to be referring to the people because she calls the guy very grave. Oh. So I think it's like those people are the grave. But like, yeah, that's what I thought, too, because I thought the same thing. I was like, really? This for it being called the grave, like he's in a grave like <laughs> once in the beginning. But so that and then when she mentions like, oh, you're so grave. I was like, oh, OK, okay well, that, that's clever. I like that. OK, OK. <laughs> new will, dimension. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll go along with that. But yeah, it's it's not it's I mean, it's just. It feels very trite as a cover to me, uh, you know, and I, I noticed this a, a bunch with the later covers, and I think it's because they just weren't, I don't know, weren't spending as much time on, mm. on but, you know, as we got into the late 90s, this genre was dying. Uh, you know, the horror just became adult horror and, and YA books were changing. And so I, I don't know if that's what it is or it just, it does not feel like Christopher Pike. It feels like an R.L. Stein knockoff. I think that's why it's like that though, because around this time is when he also started re-releasing all the other ones. So the other ones that have mm. like the girls on the cover, like the real faces, I bought those editions at the same time that I bought this one for the first time in this edition. Oh, and okay. So I think that that's what it was because at the time, like YA books, especially like YA thrillers and stuff, they did have a lot of people on the front. Like they weren't so much artsy like anymore. Pictures. And yeah, stuff. that was yeah. more like early '90s and '80s. So I think yeah. he was just leaning with the change in the industry. Um, I don't, I don't particularly like. I prefer the older covers just because I think they look more like kitschy and cool. Um, yeah. But like, I I think this one fits in kind of with the time. And at the time when I got this book, when I was like. I don't know. I don't remember how old I was, but I was a teen and I, I was creeped out by it. Like reading this alone at home, like at night, that cover, I had to flip the book over and then I was like, oh no, it's still there. Like it was, <laughs> it freaked me out. <laughs> she's got a scary face. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She's very scary looking. So it was effective in what it set out to do. <laughs> do you guys know how much like involvement he had in his covers? From what we have gathered, I mean, there's very little actual information because Pike doesn't talk much. Mm. Uh, but from what we have gathered based on what he has said and based on a character that's very definitely him in one of his books, um, he has to submit suggestions for the cover well in advance of even finishing the book. And so they're making the cover and they're designing the book and they're writing the back copy while he's still working on the book, which is why the back copy and the cover sometimes don't really reflect what's inside. Uh. And it's because, I mean, there, this whole machine, you know, with him, with Stein, is about turning out three books a year. So there's not really the time to revise, you know, oh, I changed my mind. Now this book is about this. Well, okay, this is what the cover looks like. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. So we think that's the case. One one day we hope to talk to him and find out what the what the yeah, deal is. He should come on the show. We, we've been saying. we we are we are communicating in in dribbles, which is from what I hear the way he communicates. So Interesting. Uh, but but there is a connection. There is a line between the Pike cast awesome. and Mr. Pike. I can't it's wait for that episode. Me either. <laughs> it, it'll be it'll be terrifying. Do you guys think he's listening right now? Well, he has listened to at least one episode. <gasps> he corrected awesome. us once. Yeah, yeah he, he corrected. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. But he it also said we had some we had some great theories in our Whisper of Death yes. episode. So he, did say that. he he heard that one. Wow. Which and and that that immediately made us like, oh, should we change the way we talk about this stuff? <laughs> if he's 
listening. No, we can't do that. That's a violation of our integrity as podcasters. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, that podcaster integrity shit. <laughs> but cool to know he might be listening. Right he might now. be. There's every possibility that he might Hello, be Hello, Mr. Listening. Pike. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Mr. Pike. <laughs> Well, why don't we move into the Midnight Club and start dissecting our characters from the grave? Oh, wait a minute. Wait, you separated Ted and Oscar on purpose? Yeah, because Ted and Oscar are really different characters. That's fair. I mean, I think they we can, can be the, at the same time. We can talk about them at the same time. That's fine. So, Ted Lovett. Which I can never hear the last name Lovett without thinking about Mrs. Lovett and the worst pies in London. <laughs> uh, but he's also Oscar. You're right. You're right. So let's <laughs> let's talk about uh, and and he also is involved a little bit in the structure of this book, which opens with a longer than usual preamble with a character that doesn't really come back, especially if you don't think he's the same guy until it's revealed like two thirds of the book. Uh, we have Ted who's picked up by a really annoyingly distant girl. I think, I mean, I, I, I get it, but I would be annoyed by her. Yeah. She's a little like basic mystery girl. <laughs> yeah. She, she's manic pixie, creepy girl. Yeah. Uh, but there's this this section is really interestingly written, and it was the the section. I mean, immediately I knew I was reading a more mature Pike, and not necessarily mature in the content, but the actual writing itself felt lived in in a way that some of Pike's early writing doesn't. You know, he immediately loads the book with Ted Lovett did not know, of course, that the last that last morning when he woke up, he would be dead and buried by midnight. Like he's he's snappy. Yeah. He, uh, he's also not writing in um, passive voice nearly as much. So, I mean, I, there it feels like a, a growth uh, as a writer. His plots are still a little iffy, but. The actual textual content, I think, really was elevated in this book. Yeah, well, in terms of like that, in terms of the first chapter, I love how that's written. He's, you know, using like Hitchcockian suspense where yeah. we know that he's dead, that he's going to die and he doesn't know that yet. And it, yeah, and it feels like it feels like Hitchcock. It feels like the way King likes to play with us. You know, in the oh, and that was the last time he ever saw her. What? No. <laughs> but that, yeah, there's, it's a really interesting opening. It is just also odd at the same time because it feels like it should have been a flashback later. I feel like I wouldn't have known that it was the same character if we hadn't done this first. I'd, of course, if we hadn't done this first. I wouldn't have met this character. So, yeah. But it feels like, I mean, like if I'm the editor, I'm saying, why don't you put this as a flashback after Oscar reveals who he is? Hmm. What do you think? I like the creepy setup. Like, I like that they toss you into it with a cult. And like, I think, so I think about his writing, the way that you're talking about how his like writing voice is a little bit different. This, the way the beginning starts out reminds me of how he writes in other books, just in the dream parts. Like, yes, when yes, he's for talking, sure. Like, to other beings or something. So um, I liked that about it, but it also, I wasn't sure like if it was really happening or if it was just something that somebody was dreaming or what. And then when they go cut from that hard line from Ted to like starting over with this new character, I was like, oh shit, like the first person we meet's dead now. Awesome. <laughs> right, I, right. I loved that start. And like, plus <laughs> then you're like, oh, there's a cult, there's blood being thrown on people. Like this is wild. I can't wait to see what happens. And then we're introduced to a 17 year old girl, which is a little bit less exciting, but. Well, yeah. And, and it was funny because I was all excited when they said he wasn't that old, 19. It's like, whoa, 19 yeah. for a main character in a Pike book. She's not 17. 
That's <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Chapter but two. But no, yeah. Then <laughs> then we get our seventeen year old girl. It felt like um like a teaser or like an opening to like a horror movie. Like yeah, like the um like the opening of Scream. You know, where yeah, your right. main character dies suddenly. You could definitely put the title after this um scene. This oh, thinking of it scene. like the Drew Barrymore opening. Like I didn't yeah. think about it like that. I like that. Yeah. And there's there's some really uh, really good right like in the first paragraph here, he says like everyone else on the planet only decades premature he would end up in a dark box in the damp ground not moving not knowing a forgotten form kept alive only in painful memories. It's florid. I like it a Is lot. Is that even true though to the rest of the book? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right <laughs> no, i mean we don't know how long he was in the ground that's fair okay. i suppose i mean he's more than just painful memories <laughs> later on <laughs> you know you know what this feels like though and knowing how pike works this feels like a writer sitting down at their computer and writing without a plan yeah this character, this scene was created full form. It wouldn't surprise me if Pike dreamt it. Then he retconned the rest of the story that he was writing to fit with this. It I, feels I, unquestionably like that. I have to be honest that I felt the whole book kind of felt like he was just going and seeing what would Come. Oh well, I mean, I think I think Pike is a pantser. Like he he he's uh, he's not a not an outliner. He just flies by the seat of his pants and hopes that everything works out in the end. Yeah, it, we... it also felt. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here slightly, yeah. but it also it just felt like he's like testing out ideas as he's mm-hmm. going because mm-hmm. there were lots of like like little um, like drops here and there of like. Maybe it was aliens. Maybe right. it was vampires. Right, <laughs> and it's right, like, right. like he's trying to figure it out at the same time. And then that is something that we've definitely noticed in Pike's work in general is that he is just noodling around with ideas. And when his when his stuff is firing on all cylinders, those ideas all sprout. You know, so like he's he's sowing all this shit in the ground. And then it's like, okay, well, these work, so let's go with those. Mm-hmm. But but sometimes, like, remember me, everything produces fruit. You know, it's just, it's it's a really, uh, I mean, it, it keeps you on your toes because it doesn't feel pat. It doesn't feel structured in a way that, um, you know, it's not like J.J. Abrams' puzzle box. It's not like literally everything will be important because it, it's it's messier than that. And I think while that could be a detriment for some writers, for Pike, it's it's really not. And I think a lot of it, too, when you're reading his books, especially for the age range that he was writing them for, most teens and kids aren't reading. And then, like, three chapters later, going back and being like, wait, did this fit chronologically? <laughs> what happened before? Like, we're just like, oh, shit, could it be aliens? Oh, my God, maybe it's vampires. Yeah. Oh, there's explosions and somebody's arm just got ripped off. That's crazy. Like, that's what I was doing even now, like, as an adult. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Turn the page. What? No. <laughs> Basically, a clay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ted, uh, Ted dies. And is brought back to life, and we'll deal with how he was brought back to life later when we get there, um, and becomes Oscar, an interesting-looking guy. <laughs> and that's I really... Yeah. imagine him looking like Jack White. Okay, I could see that, <laughs> yeah. Uh, pale, otherworldly a little bit. Long brown hair, or longish brown hair. Yeah. Oscar is far less interesting to me. Uh, and, and actually, Oscar felt like um, several other Pike characters. Um, Cassie, who is the one um, in, in the book with all the skinny dipping at the beginning? And the brother that was... Uh, I'm... I'm it's hard to describe any of these books. I now. don't. I don't. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, 
It's it's the one with the incest. It's the girl and her brother, but I think they're aliens. I really don't know. Maybe uh, they're dinosaurs. Dinosaurs? It's scavenger hunt? <clears throat> scavenger hunt. Yeah, scavenger hunt. The, so totally at the beginning, not. let's not talk about it. It's clearly unimportant. Sorry, it was <laughs> that was several episodes ago. And that was I, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a while. So Pike has gone to this well in the oh, past. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was with the desert and the purple lizard in the yes, desert. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I do remember that one. I'm so sorry. But the the reference uh, point that I'm I'm hitting is that he'll often have a character who appears aloof, but is really just distracted by whatever he has become. And that's what Oscar is. He is distracted by this thing that he is, that he's not human. And that makes him absolutely enticing for our heroine (laughs) because he is this deep and mysterious Robert Pattinson-esque oh, yeah. character. I definitely would have had a crush on Oscar. <laughs> the if thing, I had been go. working at the CD store and Oscar came in, <laughs> I would have been like, yo, who's that guy? <laughs> no question. And the, the CD store, I mean, that the the descriptions of it, that's fucking Tower Records. I've been to that Tower Records. That's the, like, I mean, I, I'm just picturing the little barn doors porn section, you know, where they <laughs> they, they uh, obscure it from everything else. I will say that I went on a date once. This is actually a Ted thing. Okay. I went on a date once that felt very similar to Ted's date where they go. It felt like they were driving up the PCH from Santa Monica uh-huh. and they it sounds, it feels like having lived in LA for a couple of years, they went like to the right up into the mountains where you mm-hmm. would go hiking and stuff. I went on a date once where the guy pulled over to the left. And anyway, <laughs> it, it, it felt, I was like, I feel this date. His date goes way worse than my date went. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, I guess possibly, but I didn't ask you if you can see color. So. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I can't see color anymore. Since oh, okay. Anymore. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, but but that means you're essentially a superhero from what I gather here. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't like to brag about it too much. Okay, I know that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Darling Dara, uh, which is the way she's introduced here. Her hair long and permed, tossed by the ocean breeze, the color of simmering corn on the cob. Invisible steam rising through blonde curls. On the pale side, she had lips that, though wide and generous, there's another generous mouth. We've noticed this. Wide and generous mouths are a pike thing. Were too straight, hiding emotions kept in line only by a strong will. And her green eyes sparkled. So we knew immediately that she's probably the bad guy. (laughs) Because green eyes are rarely a good thing in Pike's work. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Also here, this is fun. Her top hung loose over her chest. Nothing to complain about there, though. Oh, yeah. What does that mean? Like, was her shirt just gargantuan? I I think it's because... (laughs) Honestly, I don't know. I think it's, it's a reference because the line before is she was skinny. So she's skinny and her shirt is loose, but let me tell you, her tits are still good. Yeah. That's That's essentially what I'm getting from that line. What a strange observation. (laughs) (laughs) I also just feel like the, wait, I'm trying to find it. I'm looking through the book right now, but like around there, it talks about what she's wearing and there was like holes in her clothes or something. I don't remember holes, but I don't doubt it. She doesn't seem like she's the most fashionable, but I feel like she's like one of like from the way she looks and also being like basically a superhuman, like whatever she, she's like one of those like fancy rich people that can like wear tattered trash clothes and And it's fine. Oh my God. Fashion. Yeah. Like they love it. And it's on the runway. (laughs) Yes. 
I mean, she's here's the thing. They go ahead and introduce her brother. And he's just full on psychopath. So it makes her less of a compelling villain just by introducing a second villain. Because, I mean, she is the villain, right? I think, though, I think that that's like a common trope, though, is to have like, especially a brother and sister duo where one of them's like, they're both kind of like just batshit wild, but also Mm -hmm. one of them's like way more less controllable and the other one's much more controlled and like, um, I don't know, just like maintaining herself in a way that seems a lot more like creepy because yeah. you don't know what she's going to do. Um, and she also, I don't, I don't know if you guys have ever played Vampire the Masquerade, but like in the game, the girl, there's like this blonde vampire girl, and she's like just wild, and she says like bananas shit, but she's also like really strong and powerful. Um, <laughs> and so like for this, I was like picturing her kind of like that, maybe like not as like a little bit nuts, but like still kind of like really weird and out there with like no emotions or no like conscience and doesn't care about what they're doing. And so Mm -hmm. I I liked her. She's kind of like sugar sister territory for me. I wish she was my girlfriend, (laughs) Okay, (laughs) but I don't want her to kill me. Well, that's fair. I mean, I think, I think that's, (laughs) unless I get the serum first. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She can kill me when she wants to make more. So she'd probably give that to you. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. You know, (laughs) Something that Dara and Oscar both do, which I'm just like, whatever, guys, is that they both are like, you should get away from me. I'm not good for you. And it sets up this thing. And it's the thing that we do in in society a lot, where it's like, first of all, we romanticize the brooding, mysterious type. And this Mm -hmm. book totally does that. Um, But then it's like, because I warned you that I'm not good for you, if you, like, stay with me, then it becomes your fault that then I put you in a grave. (laughs) Like, that (laughs) then I buried you alive. Like, that's not cool. Like, oh, I warned you, so you, it's your fault. Well, it's not only that, but it feels like, you know, as, as society grows more woke, and I hate that I just said that, (laughs) it feels like, you're seeing the seams in manipulation so much more, Mm -hmm. right? And what that looks like to me is, you know, when you're a con man and you're trying to get someone to buy into the con, you're basically getting them to beg you to let you be part of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're doing. They're saying, stay away from me. And instantly making themselves more interesting. And then you're like, no, no, I want to be part of this. It's like, no, you don't want to be part of this. This isn't for you. No, I do. I do want to be part of your whole thing. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's like a form of almost gaslighting to to get the person to dig in deeper and entrench themselves in their desire to be whatever this mysterious brooding person is. Yeah. And that's a toxic manipulative practice. Totally. We should call out. So totally. we're, we're doing that. We're calling, we're calling you guys out. out. Yes. yes. Also, I think it's the, so the exact thing would be like, probably like reverse psychology, right? Like telling him, yeah, you yeah, don't right. want to do something and then to get them to do it, which it's like, no, I do want to do it. And, and then, okay. So I know we're talking about Dara or whatever, but like, then if we're going to be going on to the manipulation chain, can we just go on to how much I hate clay as a character? Like, <laughs> yeah. He made well, me I mean, I mean, like, in fairness, Pike seems to hate clay also. Yeah. So. Good. <laughs> he's awful. <laughs> the whole yeah. like, beginning where he's just like, the girl's like, I- I'm tired. I want to go home. He's like, you don't have anything to do tomorrow. We can hang out and you'll still get enough sleep. I would have punched him in the face. I'd be like, excuse me, sir. You better back the fuck up. Yeah. This is so rude. Like I'm going to sleep. I could just sit at home doing nothing, not sleeping. None of your business. Leave me alone. Goodbye. Yeah. It's. His character is very problematic for many reasons, but mostly because all he is, is an obstacle. Like there's no actual value to this character. There's no reason why they'd be together. Like they're in, in the entire thing. I mean, the best she says about him is he had many fine qualities. They're fine. Sure. Yeah. But 
Otherwise, he's awful, and I hate him, and I don't know why I'm with him, essentially. Yeah, he's he's a pretty bad character. I do. I think that it makes sense for the age ranges and stuff. Like, I, when I was 16, 17, like, there were people that I dated that I was like, I don't really like this guy, but it seems mm-hmm. like people expect me to be dating him, and he expects me to be dating him, so, <laughs> eh, like, I'm not doing anything else right now, you know? Like, eh, whatever, and it's not right, but that is something that I think a lot of teen girls do and I'm sure guys do it too but as, oh, yeah. speaking as somebody who was a teen girl like I know it's something that my friends and I had done because it was just easier and it, the alternative is sometimes awful like being ostracized or being like yeah. shit talked or having them say that you went out with them anyways and did things you didn't do and just yeah so I, I, mean, I or I even just like having them. to break up with someone that can be such a traumatic um need you know, such a traumatic moment that you, you would rather just let's just go with the flow. We're together. Fine. Whatever. Yeah. Especially if it's not somebody like he she said he's not like a, a mean person. And it doesn't seem like she's really picking up on how manipulative and how problematic that is, which, right. again, something that's common for that age. Um, So she's like, oh, I don't want to hurt him. He, he didn't do anything wrong to me. So, yeah, it, I thought that part was believable. But it also I was like, girl, come on, grow up a little bit. Leave him. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In my notes, I've like so many times I wrote, you need to break up with this person. (laughs) Should I read the clay stuff I have now or should we talk about Carrie first? You can read clay. Okay. So we're going to talk about Carrie, obviously, who is Clay's girlfriend here in the beginning. But oh my God, like, you know, we found characters that Pike seems to dislike in the past. But, uh, let's see. So she'd slept with him and boy, had that been a mistake. This is, this is our introduction to Clay. Clay had many fine qualities. He was brilliant at math and science and computers. He also read tons of books and had a photographic memory. According to him, he and she were the two smartest people in the school. And naturally, that meant he they belonged together. He wasn't bad looking, although he was putting on weight. <sighs> he was only 18 and already his eyes... No, he drank a dozen Dr. Peppers a day and loved jelly donuts. <laughs> he was no way near obese, just soft around the middle. But when they had made love, Carrie was not excited and that worried her. She wasn't so superficial that bodies meant everything to her. Still, their sex had not come close to that in her fantasies. I mean, the amount of times we talk about, here, Clay had energy. It bubbled off his slightly pudgy cheeks and kept him from standing still for more than five seconds. It's it's a lot. He reminds me of Santa. <laughs> Just the way he's described, like with his bubbly, rosy cheeks and stuff so many times. <laughs> He just seems so like cheerful and like festive. Yeah. Until he, you know, speaks. When there there is one really good line about Clay, and this is after she spent her night with Oscar, uh, when she sees him, he had not merely aged during the night; he had started to decompose. I did like that. Yeah. I, I mean, he's a manipulative ass, but she really should just dump him. Like, come on, just dump him. Let him go. He wouldn't still have an arm. How does a person have 12 Dr. Peppers a day, though, like without dying? And jelly donuts every day. (laughs) Yeah, which I – jelly donuts are so good. Like when I was little and to this day, I'll suck out the jelly and pretend I'm a vampire, and then I'd give the donut to my little brothers. I'd be like, here, you want a donut? (laughs) Wow. And so now I try to do it, and I'm like, Rich, you want a donut? He's like, did you suck all of the jelly out of it? And I'm like, what? Oh my god! Did you trick oh. him when he was a kid? Was no. he expecting jelly? My brothers, yeah, they were. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, because I'd get to the box first, and I'd be like, <sighs> and then that was me sucking. That's the sucking. Oh, yeah, we, All I the jelly. Yeah, and like I would do it too because I was 
like fucking 12 dude so i'd like be like hey bear, bear my fangs and then like hey stick them into the donut and then suck all the jelly out and then my brothers would run in and be like donuts donuts i'd be like oh you want a jelly one here and well so <laughs> not only mother. not only did you imply that there was jelly in it, like you specifically suggested it is a jelly donut eat. just because i sucked out the jelly doesn't make it not a jelly donut it still exists as what it is i just changed it a little bit it still got remnants of jelly. It was factually correct. And that's what I told my mom when she yelled at me afterwards because I did it too many times to my brothers. <laughs> they got mad. <laughs> you can you can cut all of this out. Of the oh, oh, no. This is not getting cut out. <laughs> I just I have strong feelings about this. Is, this really is like more, more brilliant insight into young Kathy. <laughs> Rich tells me now I have to eat the whole donut. So like if I if we get donuts, we don't get them that often. But for example, we did just a couple days ago. I was craving donuts, and he's like, "If you get jelly donut, you need to eat the entire donut. You can't just suck out the jelly." And I was like, "Fine, I will." And then I I did, but then I did also you point started. out you're an adult, and if you want to suck the jelly out, you'll fucking well, no, suck I the mean, jelly out. To be fair, it's not like he'd be like sitting there watching me with my donut, but he's just like every time you get it, and I don't want the carcass. Stop trying to give me the carcass, and I'm like, but I don't want to throw it away. He's like, then eat the donut. Like that's what it is, basically. Okay, so yeah, that's yeah. that's a whole different thing. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, don't don't offer me your leftovers, your your donut carcass. The You're making me really one. want to try out sucking the jelly out. Of the <laughs> it, please, it's honestly it's such a fun experience because you feel like a vampire, but you're getting jelly mouth. Like it's great. <laughs> it's excellent. amazing. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Carrie Weir. Wait, I have one more thing to say okay. about Clay. <laughs> okay, yes. I love with Clay that, like, uh, when they find her mom on the floor, mm. uh, he suddenly knows the difference between Coke and heroin. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> Clay, who are you? Hey, he, he, he said himself he's one of the smartest people in school. Yeah, he knows everything. <laughs> I, so one more thing about Clay, though, actually, I will say in the beginning when they introduce him and for the first like whole first time that you meet him, he's a lot worse than he yeah. is after her mom's situation. So I'm not I'm not saying it redeems him, but it feels to me when I was reading like they were two different characters like that second person didn't seem quite the same person. I mean, there were a couple times where he did like where he was like, oh, why aren't you answering, you know, but it it was so weird that flip because in my experience, guys who are that pushy and that like crappy have a hard time letting things go, even if the moment's like not opportune. Um, and I'm not saying there aren't guys who are better at manipulation and stuff that are just like, oh, you know, I can I can wait for the right moment. But just in my experience, a 17 year old guy who's trying that hard to control everything you do, he'd be in that waiting room like, well, do you want to talk now? I know your mom's in the mm -hmm. hospital, but let's speak. Oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give Pike more credit than he probably uh, not deserves, but I don't think he thought of this. It could be that Carrie is describing Clay the way she thinks he is. And then she sees the way he really is when he steps up with her mom. Well, did she just imagine all the conversations before that? I don't know, but she could have, she could have definitely, you know, skewed them. Maybe it's a mix. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Like an unreliable narrator type thing, but also he's still controlling Dick. Oh, he, yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure. I do think that Pike wants us to start to sympathize with Clay so that we really, like, feel it, you know. Yeah, I, oh, for sure, yeah. Arm, with yeah. Dara, yeah. He wants us thinking, oh, I guess he's not as bad a guy as I thought. Yeah, and, I mean, as manipulative as he is, she does cheat on him six times in one night. Eight times. Eight times. They had sex eight times. Did, does that exhaust anyone else? <laughs> Whenever I read about characters that have sex that much in a short amount of time, it's just like, oh, dear God. She wasn't even superhuman yet. Like, isn't there like chafing or something? Like, they didn't go down there prepared. They just happened to go to the boat. And then like, just can you imagine? I don't like, know. Oscar may have been prepared. He may have his boat kit. He literally walked into a video store and was like, I smell you ov ovulating. Let me come over here and try to, like, come on. He didn't have anything prepared. He had a nose and that's it. I Ew. smell you. It's so uncomfortable. It doesn't, it, isn't it so fucking creepy? And God, 
I know this is the weirdest thought to have while reading this book, but I legitimately <laughs> stopped and I was like, I'm glad that's not a thing that can happen. Like, I'm glad that's not a guy thing that they just can smell. Oh, the smell the of your yeah. body. Like, dude, I would not go out in public. I'd, I'd stay home even more than I do. No, that's so <laughs> creepy. Absolutely what, not. What I find even worse, I'm way jumping ahead here, but oh, I'll, that's just fine. Say, I'll just yeah, say we're... briefly. Yeah. What I find even worse is that after all that comes to light for Carrie, she's like, wait, so you didn't really like me? You just liked how I smelled? Like, she's yeah. more concerned that he didn't really like her than all the other stuff. Oh, like, for sure. Girl. And, and then she's concerned that he may have slept with uh, Dara at one point. Yeah. And she's like, okay, come on. There's more important things going on here right now <laughs> yes. than your petty jealousy, Carrie. But yeah. she's 17, so I feel, again, I feel 17. like that is very, like, the world's ending, and you're like, wait, but did you like that other girl, though? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> that feels like everything when you're 17. Well, speaking of our 17-year-old heroine, Carrie Weir, uh, her face was thin. Her nose was a shade large for her face. There's Mm-mm. her pike imperfection. <laughs> but she had a great smile, a wide mouth, again. And her long brown hair was fine and shiny. No breasts, though. Both her parents were of slight builds. I I like the note that guys liked her and asked her out behind Clay's back and sometimes in front of him. (laughs) I mean, that's, you know, say what you will about Clay, but that's shitty. (laughs) Yeah, but I think it also speaks to the fact that he's so willing to speak up to control his girlfriend, but he doesn't really speak up to any of the guys. Yeah, that, no, that's true. Him. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Gross. Uh, Carrie has a drug addict mom who is another one in our lines of either absent or horrible Pike parents. Um, her Her big time lawyer dad ran off with his secretary. And then her mom had chosen to invest recklessly with the money in powders for her nose. Hmm. Yeah, he does not make cocaine sound good in this book. He is is not a fan of the cocaine, I'll tell you that, you know. uh, And mom, where, where is that? Hold on, there's... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, about her mom, for sure she was not taking Oscar home to meet Sugar Mama. <laughs> so does that mean that mom is one of the Sugar Sisters? Like maybe the Den Mother? Oh my god. Yeah. They have to get the cocaine from somewhere. I'm sure she could be like their in-between. Although mom is not nearly as much fun as the other Sugar Sisters. It's true. And our deputy Sugar Sisters that we've uh, included in in the superhero group, I think it's, uh, and mom doesn't get a name either. She doesn't. Uh, not that I found. Oh, wow. I, I try really hard to highlight every name in the book. Just so when I go back through, I can find them, but I did not find a name for mom. Mrs. Weir. Mrs. Weir. Yeah. <laughs> um, Seemed the body's old chemical factory didn't like processing unnatural quantities of super refined coca leaves. <laughs> That's a interesting way to say she's probably going to OD. I think it's so. It's they don't really touch on it, but if you think about it, just like from a normal um, what is it like contemporary literature perspective like you could just take her sad little broken home and family and that could be its own story like that could oh be yeah we, yeah definitely and it, it they don't really touch on how tragic and how sad her actual life is like mm-hmm. and she honestly like she's a nice person like yeah considering everything she has to deal with like i feel like a lot of teens would just be very angry especially like outwardly to people who are rude or controlling and just anything to them um i don't know it just it, it really struck me that she was such a balanced seeming teenager with that as her home life. And it seemed kind of like, I don't know, it didn't really match. And it seemed weird that he gave her that home life considering how little relevance it had to everything else going on. It almost feels like it, it should have been one of those home lives that make her want to run away and join the creepy 
sort of dead vampire group rather yeah. than, you know, getting abducted into it. Mm. She does have a few zingers. I, I like this one here. You don't look like a rich snob. No, I'm a poor one. It's when they're talking about movies. That's fair. Yeah. Can anybody, I, I mean, I tried really hard, but I don't quite get the dead sister Deborah thing. Why had she not thought of her sister? They seem to have a good relationship. Is it just because she was dead? I think it was just because of, I, I don't think they said how she died. I think it was supposed to be like tragic and like the loss of her sister was so traumatic for her that she didn't want to deal with it. And her, instead of like getting her through therapy or helping her deal with it, her dad left and then her mom turns to drugs. So she's like, this is what's caused all of this bad stuff. If I just don't think about this, like I don't have to worry about this anymore. Okay. Um, but the scene with her and her sister, it, Literally, it felt like Christopher Pike watched Buffy and was like, <laughs> I'm going to write Dawn and Buffy making the bed, like having this premonition sort of, you know what I mean? Like the yeah. whole time I was reading that, I was like, Buffy, 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 but like, I just, it was so strong, like the vibes and like the sunny day and stuff. And I was just, I, I was, I really wished it was Buffy. I liked that part. <laughs> Although I don't think Dawn appeared for another couple years. Yeah, no, this is 99. Yeah. So this was year two of Buffy. One of the best years. I best, think the best one of my year. favorites. Very yeah, true. two and six are my favorite. So that it's a good one. I have a but very no I have a soft spot for three because I think the mayor is one of my favorite villains of all time. I very much like Faith from Three. Uh, I do yeah, like Faith, yeah, yeah, I do like Faith. It's all good stuff, except it for is. you know, Whedon, but the rest is all good stuff. <laughs> One, two, and three are my faves. One, two, and three. All right. I love one because it's so corny. Like when you first, that first episode, it's just, sorry, this isn't a Buffy podcast. So I really like Buffy, but like it's when I rewatch it every time, I'm like, when I try to introduce to people, I'm like, get through season one. Like I promise you, when you go back and revisit yeah. it, it will be good campy. But at first it's a little rough. Like just watch through it, please. I love it so much. From I, a, I, a I tend 10 year to skip old, season one. From a 10 year old girl perspective, Season one was magical. <laughs> That's fair. That's I can yeah. totally understand that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> from a uh, from a, uh, a a new graduate of high school, it was not. <laughs> I'm old. Anyway, there is a great uh, bit of uh, description in here. She hadn't even prayed for Deborah, her sister, when she died two years ago. Just didn't think there was anyone there to listen to what she had to say. Deborah was dust. God was a hollow ghost. Accept it. That was her motto. That hollow ghost thing feels very rich to me. Even in the middle of this other day, it just feels like, wow, you just threw that in there. It's like, there's, there's something there. There's more there, but is that supposed to be like a, a hint that like we're going to go to some metaphysical places soon, guys? <laughs> I don't know. It might be. <laughs> it's 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 one of those things that makes me feel like it's Pike talking, not the character. Mm. You know, like there are there are a few things where it's just like, wow, that was a great opinion didn't seem to be had by the main character. I think you're just telling us what you think. Yeah. So this book really takes a left turn. Oh yeah. And part of that left turn is Dr. Gary Schelling, who turns out to be Dara's father and Eric's father, the psychopath version of Dara. Daddy doctor. <laughs> Daddy doctor. <laughs> Who until two years ago was considered by many to be the best geneticist in the world. So Dr. Gary Schelling has, I, <laughs> there's a lot going on with this character, but it definitely feels like uh, Pike read about um, gene manipulation and gene sequencing like halfway while he was writing, like yeah. halfway in the book, he just happened to come upon an article like, oh, well, this is interesting. Why don't I just throw yeah, it? Why don't I, why don't I put that in the book? Because he, 
<laughs> he definitely doesn't seem to have researched it all that much. He's and, like, you're not going to give a shit. They don't care. Let's well, no, just and, stick and whatever. the thing is, they won't. That's that's it's true. true. Like yeah. you get you get Michael Creighton over here who researches everything to the nth degree and then bores people for the you know half of his books. And then you get Christopher Pike on this side, who's like, hey, gene sequencing. I wonder if that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that one is better than the other. So so I do I do think it's such a cool concept, though, like the yeah. idea of like, oh, there's these mystery genes that people have ignored for so long and suddenly we can reverse death. Like, it's such a cool concept, but for as scientific of a concept as it is, there is no science in this book. <laughs> like none. It's so bizarre because we get science in other books that have so much little like scientific things. Like it's so strange. I mean, especially considering the uh the beginning is is basically a satanic panic um yeah. sequence to then explain that away like, oh no, they had to be scared because that's how we make psychopaths, I guess. That's so strange. I mean, a lot of this didn't have did, – I mean, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's – it's okay. But you get Dr. Gary Schelling coming in mid-book to monologue. So, For, Cassie, yeah. I know you like a good I, monologue. Yeah, I do. What do you, do. What do you think? I, well, I liked it because I was like, oh, he's not the bad guy and it's not the end. So this is like a bonus monologue for me. <laughs> and immediately I followed that up with, oh, Cooper and Becca probably don't like this. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a problem with his monologuing, except because he's not the villain, he's not really explaining new information to us. He's more just giving us background to other information. Yeah. And I, so I, when I was reading his part, when he enters the, the book to me, it felt like a video game. And I don't know if it's because I've been playing Resident Evil a lot recently, <laughs> but like, it seems like that could be a cut scene. Yeah, it's a cut watching, scene, for and he, sure. Like, flashes back to his sick daughter with leukemia dying and he has to like smother her or whatever. And I'm just <laughs> like, dude, like this is, oh man. And then it's just like, ah, oh, but the, anyways, moving on, moving on past all that sad stuff. Let's go. And I was just like, no, he's going to lose an arm now. Yeah. Yeah. There's a knock at the door. And I, so I <laughs> love it too. Cause there's that pivotal moment where they're just, they do all this time of backstory and talking and there's no rush. There's no sense of urgency. And then just like you, you came from that house. Oh God, you've been followed. And then yeah, I just right. look at the door and knock, knock, knock. And I was like, this is so good. This is such a <laughs> game or movie. Like I love this. Yeah. It, then it becomes an action movie. Yes, explosions, ripped off arms. Yeah, the ripped off arm that that really impressed me. I didn't think they were going to go there. What I love about all the science stuff is that he explains everything, and then at the end he's like, "But it's essentially like just a hunch." Yeah, right. But we just have a hunch that you're carrying the antichrist in your body. <laughs> Well, that's the that's the best part is here's a bunch of science. Also, the devil. <laughs> huh? Here's a bunch of science, but we killed you on a hunch. Yeah, and and that part. Let's let's unpack that because there's there's very little justification for the fact that they literally murdered her. And turned her into the undead against her will. Yeah. To to fight a war against his daughter. I mean, it's it's she's you know we talk about Clay being a bad dude. They <laughs> literally murdered her, and she's fine with it. She like yeah. oh there there's a moment where she's like. She's like, oh, so you killed her. Talking about Dara, like, you killed her without her knowing that you were going to do that. And then she's like, you did the same to me. And then it's like, she felt bad about her outburst. And it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. Terry, you deserve to have an outburst. They killed you. What yeah, they the literally hell? killed you. They put you in a, in a walk-in freezer to die. They kidnapped what? you. Yeah. Put you in a really uncomfortable position in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Stabbed your ass with something. And then put you in the freezer to die. Like, you should be mad. 
Also, also there is don't... there is a like a weird fetishization when they when they stop the car and pull down her pants and and hit her with the the uh, the ass injection. There, I think. Wait, what happened? What just felt fetishized? It totally did. Mean? Yeah. Oh, I just I was like, oh, she got a shot in the butt. Creep. Like, <laughs> and then I just moved on. <laughs> It was so rapey. I mean, even the way yeah. he writes it, like her, that her butt is like in the air. Like, yeah. Oh, it, okay, fair. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. I thought you meant like not, I don't know. For some reason, I, I thought you were saying like the way the plunger went in or something. I, just, oh, I, no, no. I, I didn't pick up no, on this. I, I don't know. I feel like the moment was fetish. Okay, okay. Not not, uh, not the actual act of what was happening. Yeah. She's also not wearing underwear, and that's a detail that they. That is would. a detail. Yeah. I think it's um I don't know where they get this idea for the boy too because like Dara and Ted Oscar they have sex after they're both dead and there's no baby involved so like later on No like, the baby when, is because he had sex with her before she I died. I know that's what I'm saying but like later on when she's like you want to have another baby like at the end of the book and he's like well we could try like I don't know if that's a possibility <laughs> do you not you already had a sex with another dead girl you necrophiliac like <laughs> What are you trying to do here? Like, you already have one <laughs> horned baby out in the world building gardens. What more do you want? Maybe he and Dara used a condom. Oh, that's yeah. good. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Condoms for dead people. It's protection. Yeah. Even undead. Even undead protection, yeah. Okay, speaking of the baby out in the world making gardens, let's talk about the least fully formed idea in this book <laughs> john, <Little> john. <laughs> so to say funny. john was not a normal child would have been like saying jesus had other talents besides carpentry that is a very good line but <laughs> yeah so i i'm gonna see if i can figure out how this tracks here so carrie dreams of John the shadowy man in the threshold and he's asking to be invited into the world so Carrie invites him now all of this is completely disconnected from Dara and Eric and Dr. Schelling but it's also Dara and Eric's plan that Carrie do this. And it's also Dr. Schelling's plan that Carrie do this. Am I wrong about any of that? Is it? I don't, I don't know if it was Eric and I don't know if it was their plan because they were just trying to find their dad in the because they had kept their dad as a they just wanted the Lazarus nine. So they had kept their dad as a prisoner for a year and then he escaped with oscar and so they were just trying to track them down whereas dr gary and oscar were trying to stop them because they didn't want to create more of that stuff for them and they didn't want them to take over the world i don't think they really i don't think they wanted the baby but dara Dara. and eric got so excited about the baby well because they're like oh this is a whole new being like we can control this in addition to controlling everything else like Uh. cool so i feel like that was just like a perk to them but because they they said like they don't know anything about this stuff yet Mm. Well, this is the squishy last act of this book. Yeah. That's a little, I mean, it's fine. There's, there's good ideas in it, but they're, they're really just ideas. I think. What would have happened if she said, no, don't come. (laughs) Well, that would be the end of the book. Like that scene from Alien where the thing bursts out of the chest, except (laughs) in her lower abdomen. Yeah. Really? The, the, (laughs) The lie was that she had uh, the choice. Yeah, it's coming. (laughs) John is here to stay. (laughs) Well, again, that goes back to this, like, gaslighting thing of, like, like they're making her think that she has a choice in this, but she doesn't. Everyone really seems to be making her think she has a choice and agency when she actually doesn't. It sucks, is what it does. A metaphor for the patriarchy. (laughs) Yeah, and she's just going along with it, thinking, yes, I do have a choice. I have a say in all of this. (laughs) I'm going to be the mom of the devil, maybe. 
she has to bring a child into this world while she's dead. And then this child's born and grows up. And the child's like, bitch, I'm staying here. Let me go to the forest. Goodbye, mama. And yeah, she's just like, all right, guess I don't have a choice here either. Bye bye. It, it actually worked out very well, considering. <laughs> like, it did, yeah. Considering the alternatives, yes. You yes, had to be right. a mom for 20 days. Like, okay. <laughs> and now her son is going to go, like, deal with global warming or something. Yeah. yeah, that's that seems to be what's happening. She's basically like Mother Nature. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> an ooh and an ah. Yeah, okay. pat myself so, on the back. I want to I want to say how irritated I was when John drew the picture of ostensibly the devil, <laughs> and it's like, oh God, is is this going to be this book? Are we actually going to have the devil? Because that just irritates me, like. No, we get something even more awesome. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> we have Pan. I think the lamest twist of all time. <laughs> and I, I need to say, so I looked up Pan just to do a little extra research on on his deal. And on Wikipedia, I found a picture uh, labeled "Pan having sex with a goat." Oh. It's just a statue of Pan lovingly having sex with a goat. Wow. <laughs> he really does love nature. So, you know, if you if you want a little of that, go over to Wikipedia. I will definitely be doing that directly after this call. And check out Pan <laughs> having sex with a goat. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it comes so out of left field that it's Pan. And <laughs> as as happy as I was that they weren't trying to play the whole, yes, the devil is number one real, number two actually looks like that game, it was just like, oh, 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 Pan. Okay. That's a choice. <laughs> yeah. Slightly less climactic than the last game. I think it seems like an interesting choice because how they talk about when he, the geneticist guy, when he figures out the stuff with the DNA and they mention um, with the sped up metabolisms and stuff. And they're like, this is people operating at peak performance now. So this is like the best version of a person that they could be. Mm -hmm. And it's only achieved after death. So I thought it was really interesting that they make a point to mention um, like people's effect and impact on the earth and then yeah. that he's going back to it because it's almost like, so then is he going to do the exact same thing that that geneticist did with people, like unlock that thing because it's dead? Is he going to bring back all the dead like life and like greenery and stuff like that? Like, is that what his goal is now to fix it and to bring it back after death as it's new? Because that's what the guy did with the people. So I thought that was like a cool, mm -hmm. I don't know what the word is, juxtaposition or something. Like it was just a cool, here's this on one side and here's this on the other. I like it way more now that you've like described it like that. <laughs> we we have that habit on this show of 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 reading into things and then being like, oh, okay. <laughs> Whether or not they actually have anything to do with that is the question. No, yeah, I make up a lot of shit and it sounds right, so I just stick with it. <laughs> it's my head cannon. <laughs> so John is ultimately a much more interesting idea than he is a character. I think. Especially it, since he does just wander off at the end to save the world, to save the the plants. Is he dressed when he goes off? Or I have no idea. I, I, I really <laughs> just because she mentioned he doesn't like clothes, and I'm like, there was just an explosion. Did his is he dressed? I did like that he learns all he needs to from the internet in yeah. in like a few hours. <laughs> he closes it like a book. I'm yeah. done. I'm done with the internet. <laughs> And this is 1999 internet, so you know. Yeah, you probably was. There's not that internet. much on the internet. Yeah, there, there was not. There was not that much. <laughs> so we're not that impressed by you, John. <laughs> he didn't have access to, say, pictures of Pan having sex with a goat on Wikipedia. Yeah. yeah. John's Angel Fire website. <laughs> 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 well, why don't we do this? Let's take a quick commercial break, and when we get back, we're going to go deep into the plot for our segment, Remember Me. So we'll be right back with more of the PikeCast. Wow, friend. 
friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling As Good As Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, J.J. Ronvier. Welcome back to the Pikecast. Now we're moving into Remember Me, our section where we really dissect the plot. Obviously, we've already talked about a lot of plot in our in our earlier sections. But I want to start with the fact that multiple moments in this book take place on Balboa Island, a place that I only know because that is where the banana stand from Arrested Development was located on Balboa Island. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so, so we, I mean, we've already talked about how uh, we start with uh, the death of Ted, who becomes Oscar. Then we talked about how Oscar comes in and picks up Carrie at her job at the record store and how they have sex eight times, apparently. Uh, Carrie gets pregnant. Here's, here's uh, the, the first line after their night together uh, that notes it is, Carrie noticed a peculiar coolness in her lower abdomen, and I don't think anyone who has read The Stand did not think she was now carrying the Antichrist. I haven't read The Stand, Cooper. I'm sorry. You haven't read The Stand? (laughs) No. That is a long chunk of a book. It's a good book. I also have looked at the book and considered (laughs) reading The Stand (laughs) and then been like, this is really long. I don't know. Yeah. I own it. It's just... I mean, it's fair. That's fair. A doorstop right there. (laughs) It it is. It is probably my favorite book. So I'll just say... Of all of the books or just of Kings? Of all of the books. Oh my goodness! Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay. I mean, no, I, I don't mean sorry because it's true. I just mean I can I still, read it. I can still have it be my favorite, even if you don't read it. That's true, but then there's going to be a long silent pause after you make a reference to it. Well, totally. I mean, there, there, <laughs> there is that. Uh, this, this line, I don't even know where it came from, but I immediately wrote it down because it's going to be the subtitle for our episode. Maybe all this had something to do with aliens. I love that. <laughs> so good <laughs> i don't i don't i don't have any idea what the context was or anything but that's just wonderful <laughs> i want to talk about carrie uh kicking the ass of the bullies after she stumbles out of the uh freezer oh yeah all disoriented um uh, he was lewd He grabbed her hand and guided it toward his crotch. She got there before him with her knee. 
<laughs> she brought it up so suddenly, so hard that everyone present heard the sound. The noise was soft and brittle, bone and tissues alike exploding. The guy bent only slightly with the impact, but his expression disintegrated. He looked down at his groin and horror spread across his face, as did the dark stain in his pants. Even Carrie was stunned when he dropped to the ground and blood began to puddle around his midsection. She had not meant to hurt him that badly. I really like that. It's very Buffy, that one too. It It is, and it, it's also very... Um, you know, groin trauma that <laughs> we've got, we've got groin trauma come up in, in uh, Pike a, a number of times here. I have written down for that. Uh, it's a little bit after what you just read. He continued to hold his crotch, but he could not patch the dam that had burst. Ooh, yes. Oh. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrifying. Yeah, well, you know what? They shouldn't have messed with her. No, absolutely. They were, they were, they were a monstrous. I mean, they they were they were going to attack her. They were. I mean, he was guiding her hand to his crotch, like he was asking for it. Yeah, that's a weird phrase to use. He was asking for it, but he was literally. He was literally asking. We like, should put be, your stuff on my junk. Yeah, we should be using that phrase towards dudes who do that kind of stuff. I, I agree. I agree. One thing that I, I'm always amused by and that I do myself as a writer is when I try to do my take on a classic uh, character, I like referencing things like Carrie saying, it makes me wonder if authors of vampire stories didn't actually know what they were talking about. <laughs> Perhaps the origins of voodoo and zombies came from an accidental discovery of herbs that replicate Lazarus 9 which is our resurrection drug. So let's talk about her pregnancy because the time thing is a little wonky here. Um, according to Dr. Schelling, your metabolism is operating at such a high speed that the gestation period for your child should be nine days instead of nine months. Okay. That gives us a baseline, right? We can assume that a month is a day. But it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Her body, her but, body would not be able to handle that. But hold on. It gets worse. <laughs> because when John is born, a year suddenly happens every day. They're celebrating his birthday every day as he gets older and older. And it doesn't make sense because they're not aging like that. They don't age at they all. They don't age at all. So why would he not only age, but age at such a ridiculous speed? I mean, I suppose we can say because he's Pan. <laughs> but that seems like a cop-out to me. Well, there's there's no real reason, I think, that doesn't... That's not also a cop-out. Like, because <laughs> of metaphysical magic... <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I think they do a good job early on, too, of saying, like, here's all the explanation. And then he's like, but by the way, we don't know shit. And yeah, then that right. way, because of that later, it's like, well, we really don't know shit. Oh, no, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> but also magic. <laughs> um, we <laughs> This, this sideline of uh, they cannot be killed except with fire. Dr. Schelling said, but if we blow out their brains, they'll be stopped for some time. This, this is both one of the silliest explanations, but also brings up a very interesting thought discussion because Carrie realizes later, uh, if she gets her brains blown out, what will, um, what will, oh, here it is. She thought of a bullet piercing her skull. Her brain splattered over the water surface, growing new ones the same night, not sure what she would be like afterwards. That is that is the great thought experiment of like, if you replace your body piece by piece, at what point are you no longer you? 
I'm so, interested in reading that story. Me too. Me too. That's that's really the idea that if they get shot in the head, they could become different afterwards. I love that. And it feels like only a, a casual side jaunt for him. Yes. I I really enjoyed that this is the first Christopher Pike book to acknowledge the internet because there's a silly uh, aside reference here to Eric would make a home video of the delivery and post it on the internet. See the birth of the Antichrist, only $5 at revelations.com. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fun to see the birth of, <laughs> of the internet because obviously it was not a thing in the earlier books. I don't think we have cell phones in this one yet. So, did it, either of you notice cell phones? I did not catch any cell phones. Yeah, it's sometimes easier just to not include them. But I did feel like with that moment that, like, yeah, that's what people would do. They would put it online. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how you get, uh, you know, followers yeah. for your cult. <laughs> like cults that are currently happening in our country. Anyway... Destiny had chosen for her this role because she had wanted to be different from everyone else. Fate moved with irony. The universe had granted her wish and made her so different that now it felt obligated to bury her in the bowels of the earth to cover up the mistake. Carrie died. Everything was forgotten. All was silent. Blessed silence. But Carrie didn't die, so that's cheap. <laughs> Because she's already dead and she survives at the end, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. She survives because she asks, uh, because they talk about wanting to have another kid and she wants to try really hard, you know, get it? Cause she's horny. <laughs> so she wants to have lots of sex with her undead husband. I'm like not cool with this whole third act and the end. Yeah. That she's so forgiving of oh, so Oscar forgiving. and Dr. Schelling or whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah, she really doesn't have any problem with them. Even after they rip her uh, the arm of her at one point boyfriend. Like, even if he's awful, she probably liked him at one point. Well, that was Dara's fault. Well, yes. But still, it would not have happened had this doctor and guy not decided that she's the one to birth the Antichrist or whatever. True. But also, <laughs> what they directly did was kidnap her. Yes. Kill her. And then impregnate her with Pan or the anti whatever. It doesn't matter yeah. what supernatural entity you're impregnating yeah. someone with. It's what still malevolent not cool. god. <laughs> It's still not okay. <laughs> really, everybody in this book is about taking Carrie's agency away. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Carrie, you need some alone time. You need to do some work on yourself. Yeah. Forget all these people. Forget Oscar. We don't care how good his dead dick is. Yeah. I mean, how good can care. it really be? Wasn't Dara like his first girlfriend? Yeah. Well, but he is undead with like superhuman strength now. I don't know. It might be better. What is he going to do? Plow through her? Like, <laughs> I mean, who is that helping in this situation? Like, is his superhuman strength? <laughs> like, I just, unless his goal is to get to the other side, that doesn't seem beneficial for her, at least. Well, he can like lift her up and like they can like do weird things. P position like Cirque du Soleil kind of yeah stuff. all right all right um okay I feel like that would be a little bit more interesting than what I was imagining <laughs> and, and possibly his thrusting adjustments are 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 better than your average man yeah and I mean too because like if we're I mean Edward did it in Twilight and and he's very strong so Bella was still alive at the end of it bruised a bit but, you know, I'm just saying, like, if it's possible for them, it's possible for these two. That's true. And she's very excited about it. She wants she to do it a lot. It. Wants to do it a lot. 
Shall we move into the eternal enemy to talk about our overall enemy slash antagonist, which seems to be everybody, honestly? <laughs> everybody who's not Carrie? Yeah. They're all dicks. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, so Carrie asks, what did he do to me? And Dr. Schelling said, it's hard to explain, but you'll find out eventually. Enough to say it was weird. And now you're weird. Neither dead nor alive. No, that's Debbie. Debbie says that. I'm sorry. In the dream. I was going to say that was really casual for the doctor. Yeah. Hold on. Dream <laughs> Debbie says that. In, in a, like, I would like to know if that was really Debbie. Like, he never really tells us if that is her subconscious or if she is actually tapping into another realm of existence. Well, they say that they Keeps know it things open they're not ended. supposed to know. He, he does, yeah. yeah. And that they, like, opened a door they shouldn't have or that wasn't open before or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's You know what it is? That we only use 10% of our brain bullshit. <laughs> That's what that's what this all is. This is what if we used all of our brain. Which of course to our listeners we do all of use our brain. all of our brain or all of our DNA. So in all of our writers out there who are using that 10% of our brain bullshit stop. It's not true. Anyway, that's a big pet peeve of mine. You can speak for yourself. I use about 70% of my brain on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that autonomic functions are using the rest. How about that? <laughs> fair, fair. I'll accept it. <laughs> I mean, I am breathing after all. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, something is controlling your breathing. Let's say your heart processing through all that jelly you sucked out of the donuts oh chef's kiss <laughs> i can't see it but i'm doing it <laughs> uh there there is a great moment where carrie asks the doctor why they want to expand their group and i love how dr Schelling really doesn't know what they want to do but he seems very confident i don't believe they want to expand indefinitely they do want to create an elite order and I suspect their ultimate goal is to take over the world. That's so, like, basic. Like It is. It is. The time to take over the world. And what are you going to do with the world once you've taken it over? Like, what then? <laughs> People just want to take over the world for the sake of it with no plan. They have not thought it through. There's a lot of maintenance. Can you, like, just taking care of a single household is so much. Can you imagine the world? No. Yeah. I mean, really what they want is they want a plague, let's say, to wipe out the world and then to take over the remaining people, because that's actually somewhat manageable, I think. I'm going back to the stand, which I realize neither of you have read. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. I went to Dwight from the office where he <laughs> says, we need a new plague. That's immediately what I was we thinking of. <laughs> yeah, we were watching We were <laughs> watching the office and that one came on and it was just like, ooh. Yeah, I know. Watching well, that one now. <laughs> we had it. Yeah, there, there's all these little casual things that are dropped, and they're not funny anymore. <laughs> no, yeah. It's in so many things, too. So many movies, so many shows. It's yeah. wild. I find it very interesting that Carrie can see the color of Dara's eyes. They are the only thing she can see color, but she can see those green eyes. She also could see the yellow light pouring into the refrigerator, into the freezer. Really? Yeah, because they made a point of being like her, she can only see black and white. But then he was like, the yellow light poured into the freezer. And I was like, huh. but how do we know it's yellow? <laughs> Maybe that one was just a fuck up. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that one sounds more like a mistake. This one sounds <laughs> like uh, I've determined she can see the color of Dara's eyes. Yeah, I agree. We we one of my favorite moments, uh, not because it's good, is four black clad figures leapt into the living room, two guys, two girls, each armed with semi-automatics. Who thinks Pike saw the Matrix recently? 
Because they do that a couple times. People all in black with machine guns. <laughs> yeah, and the book does feel like it takes a drastic turn at that point. It really tonally. does. Like, tonally. And it's funny because it feels so much more intimate than a lot of his work until the, the last third. You know, because he's he's renowned for throwing in way more characters than we need and giving them all first and last names. But in this one, not only does he not do that, he doesn't give names to some people who are somewhat important to the story, like mom. Mm. But so it's, he was doing so well. And then he introduced a lot of black clad, uh, no named monsters, sort of dead people. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think. Becca would have really liked this moment. God, Dara, you never learn. Your bad girl persona gets boring. You're afraid to kill us because it might anger John. And you're afraid John is not going to help you rule the world. For a kick-ass bitch, you show no guts. <laughs> I, I feel like that might be enough to uh, to let Carrie in as as a sugar sister, even though she's not a bad guy. I don't know. I'd put Dara in with the Sugar Sisters before I'd put Carrie, I think. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Dara seems cool until her brother shows up. And then she seems like, oh, I better not do anything. because." But my they even say here. she's stronger than her brother. She is, but she doesn't show it. She's just biding her time. She's cool oh, okay. and calm and collected yeah. and crazy like Alexa, <laughs> but just a little bit like more cool, calm and collected. She does play the... Uh, uh, the you you know you really enjoyed it when I was having sex with you card with Oscar, <laughs> uh, where she's like uh, you faked all that pleasure I gave you. And then Oscar says it wasn't that great. Which rude? I mean, he, he you know he could enjoy the sex. It's He's okay just showing off for his yeah. new girlfriend. He is totally because In that's also the scene where Carrie's like you slept with her. <gasps> yeah. And it it it's a thing that I have, I, you know. It's it's like that that it's always amusing to me when people refer to sex as slept with, slept with, because it feels so juvenile to me. Well, what should it have been like? You fucked her. You, yeah, you know what? You, you make a good it. point. Just... There is no way to say it without <laughs> saying fucked her. Are we, and their books are for juveniles. Yeah. And <laughs> Okay, okay, you make you make very good points. Thank you, lady. Fair, though, like, when I read that, even if I read that in an adult, like, I just wouldn't even think about it. Like, I would just be like, yeah, I slept with her, all right, we went on. Or if he's like, yeah, I fucked her, whatever. Like, I would just, I don't know. I just would move on with it, I think, <laughs> the way. But I think if if it had been too clinical, like, and then they had intercourse, that would be the one thing that I was like, wait, what? What? Did, <laughs> what? <laughs> they did what now? Because <laughs> all the other ones just seem like, yeah, people, because, I don't know, people say things differently, like, and I don't know. Just, this is getting into too much now, but just when you hear people <laughs> say things in certain moments, sometimes you hear stuff and you're like, is that really, I mean, but that's them. That's the way they want to word yeah. that. I'm not going to shit talk them in the middle of this time right now. Like, you know, people are different. So Meanwhile, I'm shit talking them. You're right. You're, you're those right. fucking kids in this kid's book. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough, Cassie. Fair enough. Uh, Oscar is such a blah hero here. Yeah. It, it, like literally when, when Dara is saying that he should join them, Oscar shrugged. You're the bad guys. I'm one of the good guys. Besides, I'm a kind of attached to Carrie and John here. Like, Oh, for fuck's sake, Oscar, be certain of something. <laughs> He shrugged before before laying out the fact that he is no longer a bad guy. Like, eh, you know, I like these two. I'm going to stick with them. He's he's such a weenie. I picture him as Jim Halpert now. <laughs> Shrugging in situations. Just like, eh, looks at the camera. At the camera I yeah. like them. <laughs> <sighs> so any other overall thoughts on Dara or the lesser villain, Eric, who literally doesn't have a description I could find. 
I want to know what shenanigans they got up to after they turned Ted into Oscar at first. That's what uh, I want. I want the book about Dara and Oscar going out and doing evil fucked shit up. Like, yeah. like you know, like Darla and Angel, like in the past. I want to, I want that. Oh, and that then, cool. then the doctor is uh, trying to get involved. Like the doctor is like Giles trying to intercede. Yes. And then they take mm. him prisoner and torture him for a year. And And then he realizes, oh, I shouldn't be a bad guy. Yeah. Angel gets his soul back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like this. Yes. So that's all I have to say on the eternal enemy besides that's it. Fair. I would, no, that's I would fair. take that. <laughs> all I have to say is I'm going to turn it into a Buffy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Buffy Christopher Pike fanfic now. Not, not even Buffy like. I'm literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's move into Thirst, where we talk about titillation and sexuality in Pike's world. Thankfully, there was not a lot of pining girl in this one. You know, the, oh, but does he really like me? There isn't much of that. Yeah. Or I should marry him right away. But there is a moment in the beginning where, uh, what's his name at the beginning? Tom? Ted. Ted. Ted thinks about driving to Vegas with Dara and getting married to this, to this girl who just shows up randomly doesn't even have a phone number just shows up and i mean that's that's a lot he hasn't had a lot of romantic experience well clearly not and so right uh, cassie you're probably right he is not good at sex who makes all the art i just why why are they <laughs> I love all artists that. suddenly i love that element like i love that she's a special effects artist yeah and he's a painter and it's like are you really selling your art is that a lie like who pays for this beautiful <laughs> apartment yeah. that you live in right it's very confusing None there's of a really lot seen. more to this story that we're not getting i think yeah. yeah or there's nothing more to this story and it's just you know hey look fancy artist vampire because these two feel a lot like vampires they do so it's like i want to write a vampire story but not a vampire story mm -hmm. maybe pike was watching buffy at the time that's I really it's, so, it's like, definitely possible dara darla like it's so <laughs> i really feel like he there was some kind of influence there and oscar is very angel yes yeah so back to sexuality. Oh, right. Sorry. That's okay. I have a bunch of quotes, as always. Does anyone else have quotes before I dig in? I have two quotes. Hit us. Okay. Half the evening, he wondered if he should try to kiss her when they parted, but she made the first move. Not a brief or shallow kiss. No. She got inside him and was a non-vegetarian meal roasting over a crackling fire. Isn't that amazing? Crown so <laughs> hot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I had that quote pulled for the best of uh, the, the book. I love that so much. <laughs> Spicy. Super hot. It is. It uh, is. And then my other one is, she sipped her coffee, loved how it burned her tongue. Didn't yes. get it raw and sensitive in case he wanted to kiss her. <laughs> What is that though? Like, if I burn my tongue, I don't want you touching it yeah. with your tongue. What the fuck is that? Like, that's... exactly. I was gonna ask. I stopped reading because I was like, "What?" And there was nobody home to ask because I was like, "Am I alone in this?" Okay, so we we have to put it to our listeners then. Please Has anyone us. ever wanted their tongue to be burnt so it would be more sensual for sexy time? Now I want to try it out. <laughs> it seems so painful and distracting. Like, I can't even focus on making out with yeah. you, my friend. My tongue hurts. <laughs> <laughs> like, every other, it's like, mm, mm, ow, oh, please, ow, no, ow, please, not that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it just seems so It doesn't awful. sound fun to me. But, but Jen, if you try it. I'll let you know. Please Follow do report up. back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we, we want to know. The yeah. world wants to know. Oh, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Don't worry. Okay, excellent. Okay, I have, they kissed some more in his car, and she lowered his head and let him touch her breasts. With they were them? more than he oh. believed he deserved. <laughs> Still, she was aloof. He wasn't sure if she felt anything, even in a moment of passion. Her sighs of pleasure sounded different. Distant, not different, distant. 
I, just, I, I, uh, I guess from context, that's him having sex with Dara. Yes. But okay. Is he, did he touch her with his hand, or is it? Because why is she putting his head down there? If he, it's his weird, right? Is that? It's, not, it's awkward. Is it what is. It is. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's you don't say touch if you're unless I mean. No, no. It, I, I'm I'm pretty confident it's about feeling her up here. Okay. Okay. And not so about you know nipple sucking, but I mean his you head know going then. I just that, that's a good question. I tried to envision it when I was reading it, and it really pulls me out of some of these scenes <laughs> when I'm just like, wait a minute, have you ever? What? No, it doesn't make here? doesn't make sense. I'm so do you guys know uh about Christopher Pike's sex life? And can we talk about that? <laughs> we we don't know about Christopher Pike's sex life. Uh, I've got a lot of questions. We we have some assumptions that we have made, <laughs> perhaps um unfairly at times. Uh but no, we don't know anything about his sex life. I, I'm, I'd be very interested to know what it's like to go on a date with Christopher Pike. <laughs> what it's like to go back to his apartment afterwards. I feel like as an adult, Christopher Pike, and I, if you're listening, sir, uh, I respect <laughs> you so much. But I'm just saying that as an adult, I feel like he's probably totally fine and normal. But I think maybe as a teen, he, he was awkward. Was, yeah, he was very awkward and probably didn't yeah. have a lot of experience in that sort of thing. So now that he's writing about it, or not now, but you know, back then when he was writing about that, he didn't have the experience to draw from. So he's like, this is what this should have been. And I <laughs> don't think it is sometimes. And so that's I, my theory. I would agree with that, yeah. But, but again, Pike reason. is welcome to yes. disprove any of our theories ever. And if you want to come on the show and just not talk about that, just tell us and we're fine with that too. Or if you want to come on the show and tell us to go fuck ourselves, you know, we're all so fine with that. I might cry. Please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Cassie will take that one off. As a fan of the show, Mr. Pike, I would love you to come on and talk about your sex life. I would like to hear that. <laughs> Oh, we're setting big expectations now. Oh, God, he's never going to come talk to us. Never. never. He's like, okay, that's it with that show. He just turns us off immediately. Yeah, just, like on an old radio dial. He just turns us <laughs> off. Oh, God. Okay, back to sexuality. Uh, I don't know who the her is in this sentence, but the ball was in her court. Should she volley it over? Or smash it over the net? In other words, should she go for coffee with him or just let him make passionate love to her on one of his oversized canvases? Okay, that's Carrie. That's Carrie, though. Oversized canvases? Yeah, in, in his studio, in his studio. First art of all, studio. that's not going to support your weight. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how that, and I mean, unless it's on the ground, flat It could on be the, the canvas on the ground. It doesn't that's even a... seem comfortable. Come on. What are you, girl? <laughs> this is what I mean with the writing sometimes with the sex stuff. I'm like, have you ever touched a canvas in person? Do you know what that feels like? Well, what if they slather it in paint and do one of those sex paintings? Ooh, hot. Yeah, yeah. I, I I feel like if that were in the story, I'd probably have – I'd be saying something different. Yeah, Cassie, just picture it. All the colors <laughs> on the I do, canvas. I do. I do like the colors. And then rainbow, rainbow sex painting. Huh? <laughs> I feel like it would just look like a like smush after. <laughs> like he only paints in black and white. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. His paintings are black and white. Oh God. Okay, so they would not be as interesting, Cassie, if as as yours would. No, and they've got children and spheres. Uh, it's just not my jam. Well, his is very avant garde art, and I'm using art with quotation. Yeah. Marks. Uh, we do have the Stephen King-esque foreshadowing. No, Carrie Weir did not understand that she had just made love to death itself. So good. Yeah. <laughs> a, a little misleading, but also very good. Uh, okay. Hey, uh, here, here we have the line. Oscar and she had made love six times. It could have been eight. His stamina had amazed her, his ability to give her pleasure. She had never imagined that sex could be so intoxicating. It had been like an endless ride that had a fresh surprise at every turn. <laughs> Better than ice cream and chocolate. Hands down. Mm -hmm. ah? <laughs> she doesn't mention jelly donuts, though, so I don't know. No, no, that's true. 
I, I have this one. It's it's not really sexy, but I found it amusing. Uh, it's when she's talking to Deborah in the in her dream. She says she slept with a few guys, and then we name three guys: Mark Cantor, Gregory Bennett, and Mike Field. And I want to know which of Pike's buddies those three guys are <laughs> that he just threw their names out because you don't just throw names out like that unless you need to. <laughs> Okay, shall we move into Die Softly, where we talk about moralizing and problematic elements? Let's go. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> Cocaine was great for losing those extra inches, Carrie thought. Maybe Clay should give it a try. Oh, no. Yeah, that's really rough. I like, think it, I skipped over that somehow. I don't remember that. It's already rough how, how uh, she she's always talking about how chubby Clay is, but... Yeah, here, have some cocaine. Maybe you'll be thinner. Yeah, kids listening at home, don't use coke to try to lose weight. <laughs> no, don't do it. no. Um, this <laughs> I found this very interesting. So Clay uh, went to see a movie. We saw Kill the Cop by that new rap star Chrome Shoes. It was well written, a satire on ghetto violence. The audience clapped at the end. Some say it might get nominated for an Oscar. Is that the whitest paragraph you've ever heard or what? <laughs> it's very clay. It is very clay, yes. yes. But like everything, I, I had to make sure that Chrome Shoes was not a real rapper. It is, he, he is not. And I knew Kill the Cop, like, there's no subtlety in that, in that line at all. None. So aside from the... Tremendous gaslighting, the lack of agency, uh, Clay being constantly referred to as fat and uh, being an awful uh, boyfriend. Um, either of you have any more moralizing or problematic elements? Just no. the kidnapping and impregnation. Yeah. Just oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Just that. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. That's that's also not good. And just the controlling crappy boyfriend <laughs> thing. <laughs> So just in general, the plot. <laughs> just a lot of what happened to Carrie and how she handled it. <laughs> well, then let's go to Season of Passage, where we talk about the best and worst writing and hit pikeisms. I want to go through the pikeisms first. Cassie, how did you handle the sheer amount of milk in this book? That, so you said that. I don't remember milk. Well, let me give it to you. Oh, no. She hurried to the deli section and found two lemon herb roasting chickens, which she washed down with a carton of milk and a large bag of potato chips. Oh, I do remember that part. She walked to the grocery store on the corner and bought four pounds of hamburger, two bags of buns, a head of lettuce, a pound of tomatoes, two onions, a pound of cheese, steak sauce, four bags of Oreos, four gallons of milk, three pounds of butter, and eight loaves of bread. Christopher Pike does not think that teens drink anything other than milk. <laughs> the van curtains were drawn. Dara offered them each a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I don't know why I didn't notice it when I was reading it now. Well, I'm, I'm glad I forced you to, re, you know, uh, confront it. God. Okay. So <laughs> I also have, you know, uh, Christopher Pike. We, we started thinking it was a McDonald's fetish, but I really think it's just a a locations fetish because we have subway in this book. We have Starbucks in this book. So it tells you our time period, but we also have McDonald's where she eats three big Macs, four large fries, six shakes, a couple of Danishes. And that's where she loses, uses up the last of her money. I want that metabolism. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So, and, he, and here it is. This is Pike's thing. This is, Jen, I don't know if you've listened to the episodes where I've made it clear that I am a fan of a girl who can eat. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard that one, no. Yeah, I, I love one. the laugh because it was just, <laughs> it's just out of nowhere. It's just, I love this. And she's just like, oh. <laughs> well, uh, according to this, she remembered reading that women who ate a lot and remained thin were sexy to guys. So I guess that calls back that Cosmo article that's referenced in another book where it says that women who eat a lot are sexy to guys. 
So, Pike must have read that article. Yeah. yeah, I guess you and Pike share. A- well, actually, I tweeted at him about this, that we clearly share a formative fetish. And he said, <laughs> you assume we have formative years. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know how to crazy. take that, honestly. He says, I can neither confirm nor yeah, deny basically. those allegations. <laughs> so that's that's the pikeism section. And, you know, we do have absentee parents by virtue of being awful parents. So there's that. Uh, anyone else notice any pikeisms? Mine was just the nose being a shade too large and the McDonald's. Oh, yeah. there's And the wide, generous mouths. Mm-hmm. We have we have that a bunch now. Okay, then let's get to best and worst writing. I have a few uh, for each. Does anyone else want to start or have any? No. Okay. I I think all the writing is magical, <laughs> so I only have best of. Okay. Yeah. Here's here's one. Hit us. The alien was on his way. Seventeen and pregnant. Whatever. Just more stuff to bounce off her super cool attitude. If he ate her after she gave birth to him, it would be a drag, but she couldn't cry about it. (laughs) I have that one, too. That is is wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) What else do you got? Uh, She was dying. So unfair. A corpse at 17. (laughs) I love it. So angsty. Yeah. I have a similar one from from Ted in the beginning. He could have died right then. He could have, but the gods were not kind. In fact, if the world was any example, the gods were crazy. Love is seldom kind, he was to think later, when he was dying, choking on horror and slowly suffocating three feet under. So good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's see. Oh, I really like the sequence where Dara rips Clay's arm off. It appeared a joke, a relief. Clay stopped struggling and stood upright suddenly. A peculiar calm filled his expression. But then Dara's smile widened and she showed them her prize, taking it from behind Clay's back, an arm yanked clean from its socket. Blood spurted out of Clay's shoulder and he staggered to the side of the door. Dara let him go. She didn't appear to be worried about her uh, father's shotgun aimed at her head. I like that. Yes. And then we also have in the black and white world of the deathless zombies, the blood spread like pools, uh, like a pool of ink that had been set aside for entries in Satan's diary. So good. Yeah. That is a visceral line. <laughs> okay. I have some worst. His words meant a lot to her, but she never felt secure in his feelings for her. He had, after all, killed her once. Plus, he had a secret past. I think Carrie should pay attention to those things. (laughs) And then we have this. This is just a personal pet peeve. Uh, Clay would have liked you if he had got to know you. You would have liked him, too. He was a nice guy and smart. That feels like the, you know, when you're breaking up with someone, it's like, no, you you would like him. You should meet him. It's like, no, no, I don't want to. No. Plus, she didn't even like him. She didn't like him at all. No. So why would Oscar like him? Yeah. Yeah, it's like we're they're trying to make us forget everything we've read about him. (laughs) Yes, exactly. exactly. She's just feeling guilty, I think, or something. I don't know. And I have this, this one, this one edges into the weird section. Her blood would turn to cherry snowflakes and clot her pink popsicle brain. I love that. I like that one too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one I have, uh, it just annoys me or her, perhaps her assailant would come back at, for her after she was dead and eat her liver with fava beans and a glass of Chianti for contrast. In Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter did that to innocent young women. Okay, I have a few problems with this. First, Hannibal Lecter is spelled wrong. Uh, second, he did not eat innocent young women. Uh, she, he is thinking of Jane Gum from the book. So, yeah, this is someone who saw a commercial for Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs came out in like 1990, and this was written in 99. So maybe yeah. he forgot the details. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that's fair. Also, but the way I- he quotes it, like he immediately after tells you what it's from. Like anybody who 
who hears what you just said. Yeah, I know what it's from. Like, you don't have to explain that. What's the, ugh, it's like beating me over the head with it. Whenever I want to do stuff like that in a book, I, I would, I would say, as the man said, you know, or, or as I read once or, you know, don't, don't hit us with it because yeah. there's no reason to. Speaking of hitting us with things that there's no reason to, have you seen Citizen Kane? Many people consider it the finest <laughs> movie ever made. Orson Welles was a genius. I agree with all these points, but that is a dumbass sentence. And well, you know what? somebody you just met, like that's yeah. so presumptuous. There have been a lot of people, a lot of film fans and film school students that have said that exact sentence. No, that's, that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> but, <laughs> so that's, that's the end of my best, worst and weird section. Does anyone have any other passages they would like to share from this book? Nope. Then we can move on to the last act, where we give our final thoughts and ratings out of five pikes. And before we get to Jen's rating, I'm going to pluck Becca's from the ether. Because Becca has rated this book three severed arms. (laughs) That is her rating for the grave and thank you becca for sending in your rating early so jen where do you stand um i also will give it three what do you call it pikes oh it's pikes pikes or stuff or whatever you know really we're very flexible but it is out of five pikes okay i'm gonna give it three muffins (laughs) 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 because they are all obsessed with eating muffins That's true. (laughs) That's true. Because parts of it I really like. I really like the first half. And I think the midpoint twist is interesting, but I'm not cool with her whole, like, forgiveness. And the book not wanting to recognize, it's problematic. Agreed. Agreed. Cassie, where do you stand? I think I'm going to give it... I'm going to give it three and a half pikes and then also throw in a little peppermint on top (laughs) while we're in the grave. Um, And yeah. And so I I liked it. I do agree that like the problematic things, I wish there had been even just like a line where she was like, I had no choice up to this, but now I'm making the decision to do this because of this. Like yeah, something yeah. small would have made that better for me. Um, but overall, there were a lot of things um, going into this and I wasn't super excited because I didn't remember it. I think I had only maybe read it once or twice when I was younger, but there were things in it like pan in general that just stuck with me that I didn't place as being in this book. So I think it was really cool. And apparently it was very um, influential to me because it stuck <laughs> around so long, even though I didn't know that's what it was. So I give it, Three and a half plus a little bit extra just because it was fun, but there were some issues with it. Absolutely. I am also going to give it three and a half, and the half is a syringe stuck into someone's butt. (laughs) Uh, I'm giving it three and a half because I really think that while the plot is squishy and does recycle a lot of his uh, usual themes, um, I was so impressed by the... Uh, growth of his writing in general, you know, the, the lyrical work in here is far more substantial than I think it's been in any of the books we've read thus far, which have lyrical moments, obviously, as we talk about the best and worst writing. But I think overall, I felt that this prose was far uh, greater than in the past. So Jen, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. And we hope you will come back to talk about another Pike book in the future. Oh, wow. Would love to. We we will set that up. Uh, Before we go, will you tell our listeners where they can find you and your work online? And if you have anything specific you'd like to promote, now is the time to shill. Yeah. So uh, my movie, The Ranger, uh, which is has a YA vibe to it. It's Mm -hmm. about teen punks they get in trouble with the cops and go out to the woods where they come up against a killer park ranger nice that is on shutter so you can check that out and also we had a novelization written for the movie 
uh, written by Ed Kurtz. And the art, which is um, by Dyer Wilk, is very inspired by Christopher Pike covers. So you oh, can check awesome. out, yeah. Yes. So check out the uh, novelization for The Ranger at theranger-movie.com. I need to ask you, how does how is it to read a novelization of something you created? It's really bizarre and awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome and bizarre. Um, I can only imagine. That's That seems so surreal. Yeah, and Ed Kurtz is so cool because he really, like, stuck to the our overall film, but then he also created this internal world for the characters. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was it was a very lovely experience getting oh. to, especially like, getting in a hold your book yeah. in your hand for this, yeah, movie that you created. It's cool. I got That's it for awesome. Christmas, the book, because I was really excited about it. Because I saw I saw the Christopher Pike S cover after I had seen the movie, <laughs> and I loved the movie. And I was like telling all my friends to watch, and they were like, "Did you know there's a book?" And I actually know Ed and his partner. Um, so I <laughs> I didn't know that there was all these like crisscross intersections until after <laughs> when we had already scheduled this, and I was like, "Oh my god, like this is so cool!" So I think you're awesome, and I'm really glad that you could come because I'm a big <laughs> oh fan. <my laughs> well, thank you, thank you for checking all of it out, and thank you, and I'm so happy to be here. I've been a fan of you guys just listening to your oh. podcast week after week. So it's so lovely to come on and chat with you. As I said, when I first hopped on the call, I was like, this is now like an, you guys are, are voices that I've been hearing. <laughs> and now this is like an interactive experience. <laughs> and and you never fell into the trap of just listening. See? No. Yeah. It's true. I, you did I, very well. Thank you. <laughs> well. Thank you. Podcast pro. Yeah. <laughs> So Cassie, where can we find more of you online? You can find me on social media. My username on Twitter and Instagram is Control Alt Cassie, C T R L A L T C A S S I E. And then you can find my art and books at shop let's get galactic.com. You can find me at Cooper S Beckett.com and on all social media at Cooper S Beckett or Beckett Arts for my uh artistic endeavors. Um I will, again, caveat that if you don't like political talk, do not follow me on Twitter because I don't give a fuck. That's it. That means I'm going to follow you on Twitter. (laughs) Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, I've had a lot of people give me the, why don't you stick to what you're good at? Like, okay, well, first of all, I don't know what I'm good at. (laughs) Maybe you're good at tweeting about politics. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe I'm really good at just bitching and ranting on Twitter. Maybe I'm that's good what at I'm making good at. you mad. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever someone asks me to stop, I just double down. That's the way I look at it. So if you don't like it, don't ask me to stop because you're just getting more. Just don't follow me for fuck's sake. Yeah. I'm gonna but follow the big cat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're going to get it. (laughs) Cassie, will you tell our listeners where they can find our show online? Yeah, you can follow us on social media at The Pike Cast. It's all one word. We'd really appreciate it if you shared pictures of your books. Uh, We'd really like to see your stacks. Or if you're just reading a single one with the episode, we'd love to see that too. And use the hashtag show us your pike. And then we can interact with it. We can retweet it. We can comment on it. You'll get stuff from me, Becca, and Cooper. We'll all just blow up your notifications. Um, And then you can also find us, we have a Patreon. So that helps us uh, do things like um, transcription, helps us keep things running. Um, Podcasting does sometimes get a little bit pricey. So we'd really appreciate it if you signed up to our Patreon. It helps a lot. Thank you. So, Pikers, your homework for next time is one of Cassie's favorites, the Starlight Crystal. Yes. And so we will we will be excited to talk about that with y'all. Thank you again, Jen. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, listeners. And we'll see you next time on the Pikecast. Woo! You survived the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams.